Today in Ria Shack, we talk about what does this and this have to do with one another and why are you connecting RG58 to this connector. We also talk about your Wi-Fi router and what type of connectors you use for those. We also find out can your Wi-Fi antennas connect to your handheld radio. And finally, we talk about why does your cable guy have these connectors that you find in a ham radio station. All coming up. <laughs> Greetings everyone and welcome to Ria Shack. I am N2RJ, your friendly ham radio operator with tips, tricks, and news and views and other cool stuff in ham radio. I'd like to give a special shout out to people coming here from hackaday.com. Thank you very much for posting my video. And please, if you want to share my videos anywhere else, um, you're more than welcome to, and I really do appreciate it. Bring more people into the party. Be sure to like and subscribe. This way you don't miss a video. We're posting a lot of new stuff, and I do try to do videos two or three times a week. And be sure to check out some other videos while you're on the channel. We have a lot of interesting stuff. Finally, if you're interested in ham radio, if you have a tech question or other question, leave them in the comments below and I'll take a whack at them. All right. And um, we'll, um, we'll definitely um, try to answer your questions. Okay. So last time we talked about connectors, I did the N connector. And before that, I did the PL259. There is a lot of, um, uh, of people who are asking is RG213, that is the little fatter coaxial cable, is that the only kind of cable you can connect to a PL259? The answer is no, actually. You can connect thinner cables such as RG58, um, I believe RG59, and you might even be able to squeeze in RG6, although with the imp impedance mismatch, it might be a little difficult. So if you notice in the back of this, RG, um, this PL259 connector, it has screw threads. And those screw threads are not just so that it could grip on to the coax, but they actually sell this little reducer here, which is basically it has screw threads and the back hole here could fit the size of RG58 coax. So what you do is you strip back the RG58 coax. First of all, you push it through, you strip it back you put the center conductor in here, you solder it on, and then the braid, you flare back the braid here, and then you can screw it in, right? Of course, um, you might want to do the soldering afterward just so that it's not um, damaged when it screws together. So that's basically it. These are very cheap, the, the reducers. You can buy them in like a 10 pack for like two bucks and they're not really that, um, expensive. So now you know about that one and um, I'm hoping to do a practical demo on it. Unfortunately, I, I don't have the equipment here with me to do it. So we'll save that for another time. Next, we're going to talk about Wi-Fi antennas and what sort of connectors you use for those. In the early days of Wi-Fi, a lot of us used to see these open access points and we, we, there's a common joke going around the internet that America's largest wireless internet service provider, ISP, is Linksys because a lot of these routers shipped with the default SSID, that the name of the router, as Linksys, and they had no password set. This was really designed for people to get home, plug it into their internet router or cable modem, and then they have instant wireless access without having to configure anything. Well, you know, in a security conscious society, that is more or less gone out the window. And um, even back then they had the encryption that really wasn't all that great. It was called Wired Equivalent Privacy or WEP, which was really weak. So um, long story short, a lot of us, you know, in, in the community of um, hacking and such like that, we actually went and um, we did war driving, meaning that we would go around looking for open wireless networks, not to steal data, but just to investigate and see how far our signals can go. And um, how we did it was we used a common antenna back in the day was a Pringles can antenna. So you basically take a can of chips, you eat all the chips, 
which would probably explain why so many of us put on so much weight. But um, you eat all the chips, you clean out the oil and stuff, and then you take a little piece of wire and you put it in the back of the Pringles can. And then you take a connector at the back of it and um, hook it on. And then you connect that to a wireless um, dongle or a wireless. In, the, in those days, it was a wireless PCMCIA card. Basically, a card that plugged into the side of your PC. Eventually, that went away. They had the express card format, which really was kind of a, you know, a little um, thinner version. They had the 54 and they had the 34 um, version that, that used a different type of slot. And eventually, those went away in favor of USB-C and other technologies. So, long story short, um, a lot of us have been using Wi-Fi dongles that have external antennas available on them. These are very hard to find these days. I do have one here made by Asus. And um, the funny thing is that it works very well. Apple really doesn't support the drivers anymore. And then you can use it on Windows or Linux. But um, the nice thing about this is it has an external antenna jack. But if you look at this external antenna jack very closely, you'll see that compared to and I'll just take this out here. I have here my handheld radio. And this here has an antenna jack. Now this jack is called an SMA, right? And the SMA jack is basically a small screw thread. And the regular SMA has a little hole there, a female connector. So it's SMA female and um, or um, receptacle socket. So you can take an antenna or an antenna connector and then plug that in like this. See, this one has a pin in there and it has the screw threads. So this is a little rubber duck antenna I use. I use it around the house. I have hotspot I use this radio with. This one has a pin. And you notice that this one here, the one with the screw thread, has a hole. So there is a funny thing with these Wi-Fi gear in that they have what you call a reverse polarity. Most people call it reverse polarity. One of my followers on Twitter pointed out to me that because it's AC, AC current has no polarity, so you should call it reverse pinned. It's actually reverse pinned. I know it has reverse polarity, but you know what? Um, <laughs> you know, some people call it reverse pinned. I blame him. I'm not taking responsibility for that. Anyway, you can actually get adapters for these. A lot of Wi-Fi, commercial Wi-Fi antennas use end connectors. Remember last time I spoke about the end connectors, they're lower loss, constant impedance, and they can work up to 11 gigahertz and up to 18 gigahertz with the high precision ones. So a lot of commercial Wi-Fi antennas, high gain dishes and, and other um, antennas come with end connectors. So you can buy an adapter. I showed you my Yagi, my Wi-Fi Yagi with an end connector, the Loop Yagi. And um, so that, that works. But you have to make sure that you have the reverse polarity. And it's not just these SMA connectors, right? These SMA connectors are one type. But on the Wi-Fi routers, and particularly on the older Linksys 2.4 gigahertz Wi-Fi routers that came with the detachable antennas, they have what you call TNC, which stands for threaded, um, not concealment connectors, um, TNC. So the TNC connectors were, were actually a concealment or concealment. I, I should really find out the proper pronunciation, but... These also are reverse polarity or reverse pinned and you had to get special adapters for them. So that's how you connect the Wi-Fi router. And, you know, these are pretty much available on a lot of these sites. Like um, you could find them on Amazon. You could find them at a lot of um, different retailers. I get a big catalog from a broadcast supplier called Pasternak. You know, I used to work in, um, in cable television 
and because of that, I used to get a lot of catalog and stuff like that. So they they really um you know there are really a lot of these different connectors. Okay, so that is about the Wi-Fi, and um, let me know if you want me to do a whole episode on Wi-Fi and ham radio. I know there are some cool stuff going on with that. There is Arden, which is the Amateur Radio Emergency Disaster Network. There is a lot of developments using Wi-Fi gear. There are people going hundreds of miles with Wi-Fi. There are people using Wi-Fi for point-to-point links. Really cool stuff. Okay, next we're going to talk about why you find the F connector in amateur radio stations. Coming up. If you have internet access in the United States and other countries, you probably have it through coaxial cable, unless you're one of those lucky people with fiber, or you have a DS, you're one of those unlucky people with DSL, or you have some other method like satellite, you probably have some interaction with the cable company. In high-end or even low-end amateur radio stations, you'll find a lot of people using F connectors in some part of the station. And it's not just to connect the TV that they watch when they're working FT8. There's a joke in there somewhere. But it does have a legitimate purpose. So let's go back to something I'm going to cover in a future video that a lot of us who work or make contacts on different amateur radio bands, particularly the low bands, the low bands, which are 40, 80, not so much 40 meters, 80 and 160 meters and below. We use separate transmit and receive antennas. And the reason for that is that the transmit antenna doesn't receive as well as a receive antenna. It receives all the signal, but it receives all the noise. The receive antenna receives less signal, but also receives a lot less noise. So a lot of us use receive antennas. I personally have long wires of beverages stringing out through the property going, and that's how I listen to a lot of DX on on low bands and how I've worked a lot of DX on low bands. So, you know, I work a lot of countries on, on 80 and 160 meters. I talk to them and I, I, I have DXCC on that band, by the way. Um, for those of you not in damage radio, we, we have a system where we get awards for, for contacting different countries. I did a video about awards. You can check it out elsewhere on this channel. So long story short, receive antennas, you don't really, you're not transmitting through them. Okay. They're strictly for receive. Most radios, most modern radios, a lot of modern radios, the, the more expensive ones, um, notable exception would be the ICOM 7300. They have receive antenna ports, a separate port that says receive antenna or RXANT on them. And that's where you connect your antenna for receiving only. The ICOM 7300 in particular does not have a separate receive antenna port. It was probably omitted to keep size and cost down. But um, there are aftermarket solutions that allow you to have a separate receive antenna. On a lot of these radios which receive antenna ports, they actually have them as RCA jacks. You know, the kind of jacks you find on your home stereo equipment. So, or, you know, the old VHS camcorders or whatever. Or your Super Nintendo. So, um, you can, you can actually, um, figure out where I'm going with this. These are smaller connectors and they're cheaper using cheaper cable because you don't really care about the amount of signal coming out from receive antenna. You care mostly about the amount of signal that's proportional to the amount of noise. You want more signal, less noise. And, um, you know, it's called a signal to noise ratio. Anyway, you get, um, you, you connect up these antennas with low cost as opposed to low loss RG6 cable, which is what you find from the cable guy or the cable company. And a lot of these cables are nice because they're small. They could fit on and through various small pipes or whatever so you could protect them. They also, some of them come flooded with a gel so that if the deer starts to chew on them or something that they will just heal themselves. So they're, they're really, really nice for that purpose. 
So you use F connectors on them, right? And you use a nice compression tool with them. And these actually create a nice weather sealed connection. To strip these cables, you use a special stripper. You use one and it basically cl clamps on and you turn it and then um, you twist it a few times and the right amount of shield and braid and jacket will come off and then you put in the connector and then you squeeze the compression and you're good to go. That's where you use the F connector. Sometimes on my radio, my receive antenna port is BNC. I made a mistake and I bought these. These are F connector female to BNC male. In theory, they should work, but remember last time I explained that how the impedance mismatch has to do with the pin size. So the BNC has a thicker pin on 50 ohms than 75 ohms. And these are really designed for closed circuit TV where you put an F connector on one end and you put a BNC on the other and you plug that into your equipment and it's supposed to work. Well, the F connector on my flex radio turned out to be a 50 ohm, um, not the F connector, sorry, the BNC receive antenna port turned out to be in a 50 ohm. And silly me, I thought this would work. It didn't. I just got no signal whatsoever. Thankfully, it wasn't the other way around and I didn't destroy the connector. So at least there is that silver lining. Anyway, so this is why you'd use the Cable Guys connectors in your ham station. All right. Thanks for watching. Next week, we're going to cover um, alternative operating systems, particularly I'm going to start with Mac OS. I know there are a lot of Mac users uh, and who are hams and those who are using Macs and considering getting licensed. As always, like and subscribe. Keep this channel growing and stick around for more videos. Share with your friends. Thanks for watching. 73 and 2RJ. Have a great Thanksgiving or whatever holiday you celebrate. See ya. Thank you.